So when we talk about insights, the, the, the reason that I kind of spend a lot of time relating this is that a lot of times the insights are the thing or are the output that is where research leads us. And in UX and in design thinking, a lot of what we spend time trying to understand is what, what humans are doing. What problems can we observe? Or what, and problems makes it always sound negative. What can we know that is unique? that is worth either manipulating or changing or, or, or making anything. Now, when we're talking about problem solving, it's very easy to kind of do that. But not everything that we observe and find curious and want to synthesize into an insight is quote unquote a problem. Um, because problems associate that like, oh yeah, well you all you do is change A and B and then that is different. Insights you may not actually have to, changing things may not change the insight, right? And when we think about what insights mean, that allows us to kind of relate and understand something and then drive and it has a, it leads to a lot of opportunities. You might have this opportunity at which it says like, because I know that, I now can think about a bunch of solutions or a bunch of opportunities to, to, to help that person. So in, in that, I think an important aspect of thinking about our insights is do they contain the context at which we need them to do? Do they have all of the H's and W's? The who, what, where, when, why, and what, right? And these start to revolve around a solution, right? We're gonna be generating as many solutions as we can next week, and I think an important aspect of that is if you don't know some of these things, now this seems very trivial and simple, right? Like, oh, you're solving a problem, you gotta know the who, what, where, when, why, and what, but the, the, we've already started engaging in that by going to the museum, by talking with users, by generating coder personas, by engaging in uh, insight gathering, and by understanding something about our business. This creates the context in which we can either see problems or where we can relate, and we could say, well, what about this? That allows me to understand how that happened, and part of our interviews even started to get at these five why questions, right? Which starts to lead to this stuff. Now, if your insight is missing or lacking some of that, go back through and ask if it contains all of these components. Because then that can lead us to say, well, why is it missing that, that output? Now, part of this is a writing exercise, which most of it, which thinking is writing, right? And, and design is thinking. But most of what we, if you've noticed, has been these kind of mad lib writing exercises. And part of that is that most of the time when we're doing these deliverables or outputs, they become something that non-designers or quote unquote, our clients understand, right? And if they are pitchable in a way that is unique, clear, and communicate well, then you can start drawing what that equals, right? And if the best part about dropping and, and putting great insights into the world is that your clients, most of, I've never had a scenario where you had a really great insight and the client went against it. Because it's hard to fight truth. And when you have that, it's almost like, um, I like to call it the inceptioning rule. Like you are like planning ideas inside your client's head as you're like just generating enough definition around what is worth designing and not. And insights help lead to that, like those seeds and being able to present that, that information early. And if you have all this context, it is setting up for telling an interesting story and telling a point of view. And, we, we're, and we're starting to kind of, we look at this in the process, we're starting to kind of close out the first diamond in the empathy and uh, you know, research and empathy and, and an IDA phase, right? The discover and the define. And what we're gonna do today in a couple of uh, quick exercises is really start to re wrap up so that we can get to a point where our insights are strong enough that we feel confident in coming to class next week and just like generating a bunch of ideas. And if your insight is good, you'll start saying, well, what if, or you might, it starts to lead you, you'll, you'll see that they start to lead you into a path of trying to come up with answers. And that, that's the best part, because generation is what we as designers are kind of judged on at certain times. We need to be able to do that. Now, again, I'm going to show a bunch of these maps as like where, where we are, right? 
We've got some customer insight maybe. We're trying to relate and understand what that means. And that allows us to generate a point of view. And that point of view is about being as clear as possible about what we're going to ideate about. <gasps> now, um, when, we, when we, we started with this kind of at the end of the, of the day um, last week, right, where, where insights were just starting to kind of come in, into view and some of us had written up a couple of them as, as a relationship. And what I think we, we need to kind of take a pass through is if you don't have an insight, you need to get one and you need to write it into a point of view, right? This is starting to add that who, what, where, why and part of your, your insight output. And the surprisingness nature of this can be that like you set it aside for a couple days and then you're reading it back again. You read this to a stranger in an elevator, they'd be like, wow, that, that is insightful. That feels like you know something about that person or that space or that output that, that I couldn't just glean by standing outside. And I think a key to a surprising insight is everyone is surprised a little differently. But if you're not surprised by your insight, dig a little deeper, right? We have this week to kind of really refine and look at these things in a, in a nature that's there. Does that make sense? D does anybody have this point of view that they're like, I think my insight is like really good? They would want to put into the, 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 um, the channel. But it's okay. We'll, we'll continue to do this. Oops. Um, oh, it's here. Sorry, there's so much interface that you have to deal with with this thing. Um, I'll go back to this. Now, if you want to, if you want to add that into your into your um, into the the chat, um, please do. Now, for us in the in this relationship, the insights really differ from business thinking in a very key way. And this will be, um, come more clear next week. Sorry. Next one. Okay. Um, when, when, we, when we start doing this next week, um, part of what, will be, what design thinking allows for is not just that we have a couple of problems and it funnels down to one solution. This is a very kind of business relationship. We have a problem with our output. We have a problem with this thing. We can, we can observe problems and we're only gonna, we only have time to solve one. But when you do design thinking, it splits that. And it says, let's do all this objective thinking, look at our user for what their problems are, and then we can come up with multiple problems and multiple solutions out of those set of issues. And next week when we ideate, the generation of solutions is actually an output that business finds very valuable. And as designers, we want to be able to have options because it's really, it really is a bummer to not have, like you know there's a better solution out there but you're only allowed to do one because that's been defined by upper heads up or whatever, people that are above you. Or the business has said, this is what we're solving. We don't want to listen to how you found another set of problems. Now, this objective thinking of understanding is really trying to plant the problem finding component earlier in the process. And this is where design thinking has had a huge impact on industry is because before, like, for example, the problem solution was that of like Bell Labs. Is anybody familiar with Bell Labs? It's a little, it's a little older reference, but they, they created like the telephone, and they became a monopoly and they got split up. But they invented and they iterated on one simple solution, which was communicating through the phone. And now, the when they, how they solved all their problems was about like, we're just gonna make a cord longer. Does anybody have a mother that had a cord that like a, a a phone with a cord that was really long and that was she like used to wander around the house? That's what my mother was. 
It's like that was innovation back then because they were only solving one problem. Uh, person wants to walk away from the phone longer. Okay, well, we solved that with a longer thing. And this kind of iterative output has led to other things, but when you look at how the cell phone came to be, it was a, a little bit different. It was about abductive thinking. What are users wanting to do with the phone? Well, they want to walk away from their house. They want to carry it with them all the time. They want to be it there. Now, relating how one drives at a single solution, a home with a, with a, with a phone in it, or something that travels on your body all the time, is part of relating how design thinking can move into the world and into that space. And it starts to help us understand, like, have we found the right problem? We've, we've discovered some things, we know personas, we've diverged into these outputs, and now we're funneling back into a place where our, our, our insights can really drive at what we think we know about our outputs. And this then will lead us through a set of issues that we can then go prototype and create throughout the, the, the rest of it. Now, when we look at this stuff, UX and design thinking kind of live between this user needs, which we spend a lot of time understanding to this point, right? If you can understand what your user's needs are, that can really help drive what your business is going to think about. And, but if you don't know what your business is trying to accomplish, it's really hard to see where those things overlap. So your, you may observe users doing something that the business has no, no impact thinking about. And when we relate this kind of stuff, it allows us to see where they translate. And in the product world, this is kind of looked at as like, what is the job to be done? What are we going to be thinking about? What is the vision? Where is that kind of stuff going to travel to? And when we move that around, it allows us to then think about what is, where are our users' needs overlapping with the business, and how is that then going to be augmented or translated into something technical, if it requires something technical at all. So it, in, in this process, right, our insights are lying in the center of what users' needs are, what businesses' goals are, and what technical constraints we contain. And part of the importance of that is that we can translate and be able to share that we know something about our users and this is relevant to the business and then we can figure out how that could be technically doable, right? The job that needs to be done is where that vision exists and this is why in a lot of design thinking spaces, design thinking is seen of as strategy. How do we relate what it means to do? How are we going to do this and why is it mattering? And if you can move that to the front of the bus, the strategy then drives where things are moving and, and what the output is. Sorry. So, um, what we're going to do with this, I think this is the next step. Can everybody see this problem statement exercise? No. What? The problem statement? So a problem statement is, a, is an exercise that essentially, where, where before we spent a lot of time thinking about the user, we're now going to spend a little bit of time of considering what the needs and the goals of the business are. What does the Hammer Museum want from its, its end users? Now, these, this is where we can translate what our product means and how it's going to be related. And a goal of this is, again, it's a writing exercise, and we're going to take on the, the premise that we are the business, right? We are the hammer museum. Now, in, in lieu of not being able to work directly with the hammer, this kind of output would be really useful to do along with your clients, right? 
the hammer museum or the shop or the chairs or whatever like nuanced aspect that you were kind of thinking about think designing for was designed to achieve and then that could be related to your users goals related to the business goals and you it takes a minute to kind of stop and think about what the hammer is trying to achieve and when you have this then you can say by through our observations which you have done you can see that the product or service isn't meeting whatever those goals are whether it's uh, keeping people happy when they walk in the door or um, meeting customer service goals or uh, communicating to mothers and children about the the outputs that are involved in, in the in the school or in the in the, the space all these things are kind of connected to and associated with how we can create. And when we when it builds this out, it says it causes what kind of adverse effect? That adverse effect might be that people don't want to go back, or that might cause bad social media, or that might cause um, like people not to repeat coming using, or it might result in them not being lifetime uh, members, or whatever that is. And the goal is to then put into a really clear output of how might we improve the product or service so that the, the customers, the users that you were thinking about, are successful based on, and then you know, we can put a measurable criteria. This is where a KPI can go. Anybody remember what a KPI is? Have ever heard of it before? You might be on mute. I can't hear you. Key performance indicator. Yes. Good. What is a key performance indicator, Chelsea? Um, it it helps you understand if your design is successful and if it's meeting the business needs. Okay. It's something that they use in business, like stuff in analytics bounce rate engagement, uh, or, you know, sales per day, uh, daily active user, uh, uh, whether, whether any kind of business they use it, but like it translates that into uh, whether or not what we do meets those goals. Great. But usually it's quantitative, right? Like something you can count. Right. Whether it's it, money or it's clicks on a page or it's uh, return users or it's more people from this area code or what, whatever that is, right? Yeah, and it's the, the measurement basis of the M and the SMART goal process. Correct, correct. Now, and being able to understand what your business finds to be valuable from a, from a tracking perspective is something that you as a designer don't want to impose on your system. You want the business to tell you, we find this valuable to track. Because if you say, oh, I think it's important to track how happy people are, your business may be like, what? No, we don't know how to do that. But they might say, we need to know how many people are coming from X or how many people are spending X amount of dollars or whatever that means. And if you know that, that then allows you to, as a designer to say, okay, what, let's say you were designing a website, what do I need to track? What do I as a designer need to track so that I can communicate back to my business? It's not the only thing that's important because we know that as, as user experience designers and as design thinkers, we want to know more about what our users are doing. But if we don't know what the business finds valuable, it's incredibly dangerous when, the, when, when you're not meeting those criteria with your solutions. Does that make sense? Yes, it does, but how do we know then we are not communicating to the business then we are presuming for anything to be valuable. We don't know it. Well, but we could, like, this is where you gotta put on your entrepreneur's hat, or, or your like kind of, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be the, I'm gonna play the, the client for a second. And the, the goal here is that like, we could safely assume some key performance indicators for the Hammer Museum. Anybody um, guess what one of the, Key performance indicators for the Hammer Museum probably is. 
maybe daily attendance. Sure. That's reasonable, right? You could you could, you could assume that. Now, um, it, in an idea, in a perfect world, we could have the hammer fill this out for us, and we would be working directly with them. But we don't have that that opportunity. But this same set of like relationships is what you can work with 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 a client or or, or with um, by yourself. Now, for our purposes, we just want to be able to instill enough knowledge about the business side of the Hammer Museum so that we're not only just looking for solutions in our users' output. Because the, the daily users, for example, as you had mentioned, may not be a goal of what you're trying to get your user to do. Right? You're not trying to get them to come back every day. You're just trying to have the, let them enjoy a really great experience while they're there and then maybe share something. That might influence them to come back. But this is where the business's idea of what, what is a great user experience and what a user's idea of that are different. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, so um, it, this is a little hard. I mean, if, you, if we were in class, I would say, all right, everybody take like 10 minutes or 15 minutes and write one of these based on what you know and what you're interested in from your insights and what you're interested in in the Hammer Museum and just write it. Everybody want to do that? Sure. Okay. okay. So let's, let's take a little time. I'm going to uh, exit out of this for a little bit and pull up the um, the chat. So we are writing about what we uh, presume to be valuable for the museum, right? Uh, so in this like Take um, what, if you were the hammer, like, let, let's think about a specific aspect of the Hammer Museum, not just the Hammer as, as a global, like, museum. Who is your user that you're designing for? Um, is that a question? Like yes. A... Who is your persona, again? Um, uh, that's an elderly woman. An elderly woman. Okay. So... The maybe but the, this is actually, the, the outreach. More I look at it, the more uh, it kind of like doesn't the age sort of like doesn't even matter. The insight I'm coming to sort of the the the, the age doesn't matter all that much. Sure, but it, but rather than it just being the Hammer Museum, it could be the um, membership um, group or the people that are like getting donations. The donations organization, or whatever that is, right? All this stuff is interconnected. So if the if the museum isn't doing a very good job getting butts and seats, they're also probably going to struggle getting people to donate money to the museum. <laughs> so it, what? Where does that tie? So if you were talking about oh, based on your woman who's been going to the museum for thirty years or whatever, right, and had a strong connection to the museum, she maybe one person that said that, but would, did she ever express like, oh, there's not enough people who have been coming here that long, or I don't have enough friends to do this. I, I, I'm not really sure. But consider, we're, we think that there's something uh, flawed. So the museum's uh, outreach department was designed to achieve whatever the, these, goal, these goals are, right? Communications with elderly people, um, community events, blah, 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 that get whatever, whatever you think those things are. And some of them could be based on truth, like things that actually happen at the Hammer, be based on the things that, you, that you're interested in. And then they could be observed, and then you get just run through the, the, the Mad Lib, and then we can kind of get going with that. Mm -hmm. And then if you guys want to um, put it in the, well, if you get one, somebody want to put it in the group chat, that would be cool. Get that. Has anyone ever written a problem statement before? Mm, no. 
like insights, they're like you got to take a you, they'll take a, a a couple passes. They're worth iterating on. Um, and sometimes even iterating on these with your client is the the most valuable thing that you can. Sometimes uh, an incredibly valuable thing you can do before you kick off ideating or coming up with solutions. Now, we're, we're making the assumption that our product or service isn't doing what it's supposed to be, isn't achieving what it's supposed to be achieving. Now, some of that may be based on our, on our observations, but also, if we take on the business, there's a lot of things that they could be doing better. Okay, so I uh, posted my problem statement. It just real quickly. Okay, do you want do you want to read it? I, I think we can all read there in there both. Okay, sure. Since you're so, already, since you're already um, talking on in in. in in the interwebs. Okay, so I, I interviewed um, a Chinese couple who said that they found the abstract art like kind of confusing and frustrating because they didn't really understand it. So they kind of skipped all of it, and they just went to the like the impressionist, the 16th to the 18th century collection, the Armand Hammer collection, because they thought that was like more beautiful. And I thought that was really interesting that they skipped out on the abstract art um, because they like didn't understand it or they, they couldn't like connect with it. So I thought maybe because it's uh, artists wrote a lot of the stuff in English um, and kind of came from like an American background, although he lived in a lot of different places, that maybe there's like a cultural and like language barrier even with like abstract art, which is supposed to like surpass that. Um, so I thought maybe a problem statement would be that um, like the Hammer Museum uh, is kind of finding out that, you know, they want their abstract art ex exhibitions to be like absorbing, like maybe not totally easy to understand because it's, you know, it's abstract art, but at least like interesting enough so people don't want to skip out on it. Um, so they maybe want to improve these exhibitions somehow so people are less confused or frustrated and... and people would want to come back more, understand it more. Okay, so, so this gets, it does get a little bit repeated, but like um, these goals, you kind of want to double state because you could get a little bit more nuanced, right? If the goal is of being absorbing, 
okay. um, and it's interesting and tasteful, you say, well, we're 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 noticing that they aren't that they aren't being absorbing through. Then you could add some some color or context, right? Like people are skipping over and not going to, in, in at all. They are um, complaining when they get done with the exhibit. They are um, leaving and not coming back or whatever, right? Like what is right. what is nuancing how that goal is being missed. Mm-hmm. And then that can can say, well, by improving the, uh, no, how might we improve the, and then go right back to the goals. How might we improve the um, the interestingness and ta- what the the taste, whatever kind of language is there, so uh, that uh, like at least like have it interesting, like at least yeah, be interesting and like tasteful, even if you don't completely understand it. Yeah. Which is, I mean, there's that that problem statement doesn't necessarily like have a solution involved in it, but there's many options or many op- avenues at which you could then go after. Well, what are users' needs? Oh, they were confused. They didn't like it. They um, they they, they couldn't find information. Whatever that is, right? Like they, there wasn't enough story right. to tell to get them involved, and they were just interested in looking at 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 new at old paintings, right? No. If you knew what their preface was, you might be able to or, like orient that you that Chinese couple in a different way, right? Go check out the third story first, and then come back and see how it influenced this guy's work, right? Mm-hmm. There, there's like a path through the museum that could be interesting, or I don't know. And again, our problem statements should not maintain a solution in them, right? They should just be a, a statement of issue. And when you have issues like that, the, the criteria in there then can lead to what we'll do next week, which is like pulling out keywords and goals that could then be like, well, what, and then we'll do a, a few exercises about like, well, what if X or what if that or whatever, and we'll kind of get into some of those pieces next week. But that's a good start. Okay. Does anybody else have one they want to share? Hello? Yeah, sorry, I had I put you on mute because I could um, hear your dog. Oh. Um, okay, should I go ahead? Um, sure, if you want to. All right, so, it, uh, so I'm just... We're gonna like the okay. Uh, museum um, museum is striving to become a um, more of a uh, cultural center of the community, and um, they would like to generate not only livelier traffic as a business, but to improve the um, more interesting crowd that is attending to a museum. In other words, they would like to cultivate. Uh, people that represent uh, uh, artistic and scientific and other prominent communities that by virtue of meeting in the museum. Um, um, So, well, um, I actually kind of like came to it also through a... um, an insight, and um, I don't know if, if should I explain the insight now first. Well, the the insight is informing these things, right? Like your problem statement and, yes, your, and, your, yes. and your insight are kind of linked, right? Because the goals well, are some of those pieces that are there. Uh, yes, because the insight I had and the, the work and the work to, you know, solve it, so to speak, or you know, or address that would be linked to. Yes, to a museum becoming a center of a, of a cultural community, um, and and specifically, and neighbor, you know, a neighbor neighboring community uh, specifically. Okay, and so then you've observed that the museum and community connection isn't meeting, isn't getting a wide variety in age and interesting set of people, which is causing what? No, actually, there are people of all ages and all educational levels and, and, and such. 
but uh, still I've observed that it is a personable experience uh, to people that are coming to a museum, and a lot of them are uh, live nearby. A lot of them actually belong to the community. But uh, despite the fact that everyone has personal personable experience, um, like it's it came through like a lot of things you said and. Uh, well, I don't want it to be a long story, but one thing you said was like the only thing they are asking you is your zip code. There was like one thing of information that was just like sort of like stuck in my mind. You know that this is the only information really that they are asking. And as far as business, I wouldn't have such an expertise because they don't charge you for an entrance. Yet they obviously are striving to become a uh, not to become, but to stay a cultural center but thrive as such to become more interesting and generate the crowds who show this interest by going to the museum mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so all right and then what happened to me like I'll, I'll tell the story very quick my computer was dead all through the week and i was three times in apple store uh, during this week and every time i walked in uh somebody who came out of the, there's a, there are a lot of people, somebody who came out to help me knew my name and knew to address me. And asked, they came to me and they said, Marina. And I was, it was like, it never failed three times. And three times I was just wondering, how do they know <laughs> that this is me? How do, you know, how do they know? <laughs> I know right, how they know. And until today I like asked about it. So it just kind of like put, got put together. And I, and I realized that even though everybody's coming to a museum for a personal reason and a personal experience, they are a stranger among strangers and like no one knows anything about them. I mean, if they were in a museum, the only thing they would know is their zip code. Okay. So in order, and since we're wrapping this whole idea around person, a person that is coming. I think that across the board, regardless of the age, or an education for that matter, or a social status, or even a reason for coming to a museum, because everybody comes, you know, somebody drags somebody and they don't even want to be there and that's so like ended up there. But if somebody knew a, per, you know, a personal information, I think everyone's experience would all of a sudden be more personable just because somebody would like know their name so i don't know if that could come through sure. a registration prior or a que or more questions that are being asked at the door but i think whatever their experience is or whatever they came to see or however they ended up there their connection to a museum uh, as such and plus, one would improve. Two museums yeah. would have yeah, yeah. much more information about who is coming. No, no, I, I totally know, agree with you. And and what I what I think you're getting you're you're getting a little ahead of yourself, right? Because the, your problem statement is already leading to potential options for solutions. Like, what if they change that or what? Whatever. Yeah. So all all great, but that's like we're gonna we're gonna not not to say like restrain yourself, but like save that up for next week. Like you can start writing them down and you can start kind of like, if it, it, I know that like sometimes you're like, oh man, I've already written this problem statement. I have these things that are kind of bubbling up. Great. I, actually, so we're gonna... I have not, it just like came to me and I wanted to run it by you because it just kind of like just happened because I just picked up my machine. Well, no, and it... but it doesn't just happen. My point is it doesn't just happen. Like the, we equate a lot of ideas to just being at the tip of our head, but it's actually a product of a lot of the thinking that we've been doing about what is missing, right? And you can't, art right, right. you can't articulate it at first, but then you go to the Apple store and somebody says, hey, Marina, because they can spy on your phone while you're in their Wi-Fi space. That's how they know are who you are. Are you serious? Yeah. They, they, you can walk, Apple's trying to get to the point where they can eliminate human interaction on small transactions. All, if you pick up an item, it like is connected to you. It knows a proximity and if you walk out the door, it charges. That's their goal. Oh, wow. Okay. So, I was wondering but, but they also know about. that that's like, that has high value for them because if they can remove humans or they can just let people spend time in a store and then buy what they want, like 
all that decreases the touch points and other places then have to live up to that expectation because a museum is not even though it is a different sector it still deals with human beings and our expectations are risen by every other place that does a good job but then we have companies that do terrible jobs like united right and yeah. but then that but that doesn't lower the bar for everybody else that actually just puts scrutiny on everyone to make sure that you're not going to make those mistakes when it comes it, to treating your customers right see that's where i wanted to run but just to see what, but but as a uh, as a, as a user as a customer that came there i have to say that it didn't go unnoticed and it produced a quality experience just because they knew my name yeah. And it, it totally, I was not indifferent to that. Of course not. Apple knows it too. Do you know how much, how much money they spend on like customer experience? Actually, I have a really good friend of mine who is I, like the head user experience designer for in-store experiences. So I'll, I'll let her, a, I'll let her do. know that you had, that you, it, you appreciated that output because she's I, almost directly I, I connected do. to that kind of output. Now, I, do, I really think they're doing an incredible job. Now, for us, the, the, the reason that this becomes a writing exercise is that, like, just like Dylan had kind of put his together, you're, you're going to write it out, and you're going to find, like, okay, it's, like, find places to be, con like, descript. It shouldn't be a, a, a two-page tome of a paragraph, right? It should be pretty short. It should follow. The, the reason this is even a Mad Lib is that, like, I know clients that will talk forever, and if you give them, a, you'll probably, you probably think of that of me probably, but like if you give them a, a, a framework to kind of be descript, be dis, dis, discerning about what they want to put into things or not, you, you will be surprised because they then get very specific about what is key goals that they're trying to accomplish and what is that doing to their business. And, mm -hmm. and if you, usually that's, done like this is done after some conversations about what users want what other things and i've seen them change these outputs after having conversations about what users want and they're like oh oh no we we care about users so we're going to add some different goals in there and i'm like yeah but you didn't have those goals before you're now on the fly creating goals for your business that you never had before that's fine if you want to and, it, and actually it's great but you start to see how your influence as thinking about users can actually move their way into something like this. And granted, we have to do it ourselves a little bit, but I think a, a power in that is if you write a really great problem statement, these things almost become like pitches for what you as a designer are going to solve. And mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you're not even making anything. It's just a statement that is like written down and then you can go back to it when you like come up with a solution. You're like, did we do this? And most of the times that can help you avoid the, I don't like it, or you didn't solve the problem we were talking about, or I'm gonna change requirements on you. And you can say, no, no, like, we, let, okay, if we do that, we gotta go back to a problem statement. We gotta change what the goals are. Because if you keep moving the goalposts, it's very hard for us to do a, do a good job. Yes, Stan. I like that you raised your hand. Yeah, I just wanted to try that raising hand feature. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I, I think something that Marina said is very interesting, and I'd like to kind of graft off of that and sort of uh, give this problem statement a shot. And so this, this statement which grabbed my interest was this, they only collect zip code data. And then it got me thinking, well, you're right, why don't they get more information? Well, it could be that they just only care about retaining local customers and local consumers because you know they can't really advertise internationally or advertise across the country or anything like that they don't have the budget for that sure they don't collect they don't collect a lot of money obviously from from entrance fees so uh in the end maybe the museum it was designed to you know cater to the local community and they've observed that you know through these zip code kind of data collection points, they're probably not getting as many local customers or repeat customers as, as they would like, which maybe data shows them has an adverse effect on the restaurant, for example, just because the restaurant 
is something you go to after you've already seen all the art, after you've already played with all the little trinkets okay. and all that kind of stuff. And so maybe the first time you go to the museum, especially as an out-of-towner, you go and you see the art and you leave and you explore Westwood. But if you come back as a, as a local, then you're more likely to eat at the restaurant. So potentially, you know, they may be having a decrease in local visitors, which is negatively affecting their restaurant sales or their gift shop sales. And uh, they're looking for ways to essentially either recruit better um, exhibits or, or, or get better art donated um, in order to, to bring people back. So more or less winging that. But. Sure. And, and, and it's interesting how you're drawing a connection between um, one service and another service. That the, the inability for them to gain or have enough customers locally is affecting the restaurant not just the you know the restaurant is a microcosm right it's a component of the whole and so you you may have witnessed like oh it wasn't full or oh it's just like rich people like it's the fancy people just drinking wine and eating cheese oh you know that's that's adversely affecting like students or whoever that is whether that is true you that's maybe something you observed but that actually could be a domino effect as a relationship to how the freeness or the way in which they communicate its openness to people and then capture where they come from in that experience. Does that make sense? Yeah, obviously taking a lot of liberties with, you know, assuming that is what their tactics are and all that stuff. But Yeah, and... But but you're you're making an educated guess. Like that's all we can do. You know, if you were working exe- with the the front desk or with the the museum and and their and their restaurant, they would probably have things that would say very very discrete goals, right? And it might be more specific. Like the your um, the collection of of addresses actually may be connected directly with how they do mar. I'm assuming goes directly with how they do marketing. Where in this, they probably look at heat maps, of where where they know people are coming from, and then they'll like put advertisements in places where people aren't coming to see the hammer from. Because that's it. That okay? You need new you need new customers. You go to where nobody knows what the, what it is, and then you have to advertise that it's free. Um, so I think there's an opportunity there, which it, it, I don't think is unaccurate or unthinking of what the business would actually be doing. But again, this is an exercise in thinking like the business, right? In the, in the real world, when you use these problem statements, it, it's, I like 100% lean on them, you like giving this at Mad Lib to your client, right? You're like chatting with them about the user, you're trying to get an understanding, you're just like, hey, well, I want to know how you guys think, right? We could work on it together, but let's work, I want you to fill out some of these things for me so that we can we can then have a conversation around what are your goals and if those goals aren't accurate then we can have a discussion around how new things that your users are doing and we can see where this stuff overlaps now that it you are making an estimated guess based on probably what a uh, like a manager of a restaurant or the you know the director of the of the museum is starting to see as well they have eyes and they observe their space probably more intently than even you do and if you're noticing things like that just imagine what they feel or they're starting to understand that so yes you are taking liberties but i think those liberties are actually um, not as far off the mark as, as you're maybe worried about does anybody else have have one they want to share now again Get it written down because you, you had some, some points where I think the goals and the, and, the, and the measurable criteria could be kind of flushed out a little bit, like exactly what that means. Because if they got more people or more addresses or more locations, um, they might be able to then communicate that back of why it's important to do that in the first place, right? Look where everyone's coming from um, or whatever, right? Now that goes into solutions when we're doing next week. So good. Uh, Chelsea, do you want to do you want to read yours, and then we'll kind of move on to the next one. 
Sure. Um, the Hammer Theater was designed to showcase unique films and presentations in a casual, accessible setting. We've observed that our service isn't reaching a wide audience, which is causing lower attendance to the films and the museum as a whole. How might we improve our theater venue so that customers are successful based on our new and repeat attendance metrics? Okay, good. Now, there's some things up here in like casual, accessible setting, which could then link back to what the customers need so that our customers are 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 you know, communicated about its custom, how customable, how accessible it is, know about the casual times and outputs, and, you know, now the, that could range from more comfortable seats to better posters to better communication out, whatever, like the, the potential solutions that we could generate or start ideating on next week have a lot, right? Because that, con that statement is pretty, pretty succinct. Right. It, the, the statement, the problem statement is not is clear. Right. And that that's what you're end up looking for. Right. You're, you're going to go with that. Now, being able to articulate like a little bit how those things tie, but you're really close. So good. That one's okay. nice. And I like that it's like a, it's a component of the hammer, not the hammer as the entirety of the system. It's like, no, it's a it's a it's a it's a unit inside the larger piece that that is um, that is struggling. And you probably witnessed that. So. Yeah. Good, good. Um, okay, great. So let's um, go on to, if, if anybody else has one, I mean, everyone, I want everyone to have one of these ready for next week. Um, along with your insight, I want everyone to bring this kind of like, so for next week, if, especially if we have a guest that's going to be maybe joining us, he's not really sure what you guys are working on, so he's going to want to know who your user is. He's going to know want to know what your insight is, and he's going to want to know what this problem statement is. And this starts to become those three prongs of like business, uh, user, and insight. And then we can start generating ideas around a, a bunch of stuff. And if he, if he comes, which I hope he can, um, it, it'll just kind of allow us to generate more ideas because he's pretty good at that. We'll be able to do that. Anybody else have one that they're interested in? Again, if you bring these in next week, if they're kind of, you know, massaged a little bit or like written out and then, you know, made to, to be as clear as they can, this just helps us in like setting the stage and being able to like, if you're stuck on ideas, you go back to your problem statement and you read it again. And you're like, oh wait, is any of the ideas that I'm coming up with starting to slot in with solutions that could be answers to this output? So, good. Okay, so the next... Thing that we're gonna do. Has anyone ever done a a, um, a business canvas? What's that? What's this? Oh uh, yeah, I have. It's Stephanie talking. Hey Stephanie. Yeah, you 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 you've seen this thing before? The business model canvas. Yeah, a lot. <laughs> a lot. <laughs> Good. Now. The, the reason I, I bring this up is that like we start to understand some things about a business and we may know a little bit, but as designers, the, you can allow your company, if you know this stuff or you, get, or you work on it with your client, you can then understand a broader spectrum of what, you, of what like the Hammer Museum is trying to accomplish or the... the um, let just take the the theater for example, like who like knowing who their key partners are, knowing what their like their key activities are definitely going to be films and talks and you know like you already kind of know this stuff, but it is is there as a way to kind of outline a structure. And again, this is a, a an activity that is really useful to do with a business. And if if it's a new business and they don't have one of these, it's like almost. It's key because this is set up in like designing and creating business models. Um, and if you don't, if like, I, I don't know what the business is going to do. You're like, well, okay, let's start with who you think your partners are. And let's, so let's talk about cost revenue. Let's talk about how you get structure and who your channels are and where your money goes and who your customers are. Like, we already know some of this stuff. We have, we've already defined who our customer is. We know what their needs are. We know some stuff that's there. But this is just a broader spectrum for 
relating and being really knowledgeable about our aspect of the business. This, along with your problem statement, can kind of link together. So if you fill this out and then there's needs in your, you know, problem statement that aren't captive, that aren't, you know, captured in your, you know, value proposition or in your, you know, partners or any of that kind of stuff, it allows you to kind of relate that. Um, now, not every designer has to do the, like the this sometimes is a start, but it's more it's a little bit more entrepreneurial, right? It's thinking about this system rather than just the like narrowed down. I'm only going to talk about the the like you know one goal or one need of a user, because when we have the system set up, especially when generating ideas, it opens the box back up. A little bit we can start thinking around ideas of like well how would you change a channel or how would you think about a resource differently like film for example is it physical film is it digital film is it um, is it projected is it um, does it have a time limit can it be looped uh, you know, there's all sorts of stuff. Could, could you put movies on for 24 hours and just leave the theater open uh, without causing any problems? I mean, all, all those kind of things become part of opportunities. And again, if you know, if you filled this thing out, you might see gaps in what they're doing, which might help with generating and coming up with ideas for next week. Does that make sense? It might also just help you understand a little bit more about what the hammer is trying to, or what even what your aspect of the hammer is trying to accomplish. So rather than just thinking about specific goals inside your problem statement, you're like looking at how they how they apply themselves across this. So um, this will be useful. Fill one of these out. It's it's in the uh, exercise process. Just kind of go through and like kind of write it write it in there. Um, I think knowing some of the stuff you've already defined, but this is again like putting together a more concrete view of what your business is trying to accomplish. What are their needs and where do those needs overlap with what your user is needing? And that overlap space is where you start to see and come up with a lot of ideas. And where those things overlap, you can start relating and helping a business make decisions about that stuff. Because if you have hundreds of ideas, potentially, based on on this model, right? Lots and lots and lots and lots of, 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 of potential solutions and problems that, 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 that you're witnessing, you can then create multiple solutions and those multiple solutions can uh, uh, can be either put in a backlog or they can be uh, they can be assessed for how technically feasible they are and we'll kind of we'll go over this after we brainstorm and put put a bunch of ideas together next week but when we drive our insights through a, a clear problem statement then that allows us to come up with a bunch of this stuff and if we really know how our business is set up what they're where they're making money or not where their resources are who they're communicating with then that allows us to say, well, wait, how could that be different? And where is our problem statement applying that? Does that make sense? Yes. Cool. And if you've never done one of these, they're just kind of fun. It, it, doing them for an existing business is way easier than doing one for the something that you're creating from scratch or that you're trying to figure out if it works or not. Um, but if you were thinking about a business and you don't have any partners, well, that becomes a problem. <laughs> if you don't know who the problems, the partners of the, of the Hammers Theater are, well, that might help you relate and understand the system better. This becomes a kind of output research. So uh, come with that next week as well. That, that'll be kind of fun. The key is a really great, the, the two that become the most important for next week are like, a really, a really sexy user point of view insight and a really succinct problem statement. Sorry, I don't mean to interrupt. Um, what did you mean by the, like partners? Oh, in the business you mean, right? Yeah, key partners would be um, like who, 
Um, who are the, like, who do you connect with? Um, what, like, if, if you have a supplier of films, let's say, I'm just using the Hammer Theater, for example. Um, your popcorn maker might be a key supplier, and he becomes a partner in your movie making. Or okay. uh, Paramount, who gives you, like, old-timey films from the 1500s or whatever. You know what I mean? Uh, Does that make sense? Yeah, Usually they are, they are um, key partners are people that ma they make money off each other by being successful together. Okay. So you, the business can't run without them, right? Like internet might be one, right? We're, right now we're using uh, Zoom. Zoom, one of Zoom's key partners is ISPs to make sure that the internet runs fast and okay. Wi-Fi, right? That kind gotcha. of stuff. And, and you'll see that, like, there's resources and partners that start to overlap. So you're like, kind of like you got to choose where to kind of put them. But that, that's where filling these things out comes, becomes really helpful. Channels become things more about, like, marketing and communications or, like, if, you're, if they're a shipping business. This is set up broadly enough so that it could handle a, a business as simple as a flower shop to as complicated as, like, IBM or something like that. Uh -huh. So, um, it, in these kind of business model canvases, the, the, the goal is not just to relate that you kind of understand something, but it's also to, um, it becomes part of consulting. I, I found when I do business model canvases with my clients that it, it's like, hey, do you, have you thought about all this stuff? <laughs> And then sometimes there's a, a nice opportunity to be like, well, we're not going to talk about that piece over there, but I see that it's very empty. So maybe we can do that at another time, right? Or like, hey, I, we would really love to help you think about your channels. We're only going to help you fix X, which we already agreed to, but maybe we have an opportunity to kind of continue a conversation and be part of this broader spectrum. Rather than just coming in and saying, I'm going to solve X, you come in and understand the system a little bit more, and then that allows for broader spectrums because just like that conversation about the... Um, the the uh, ticket uh, kind of uh, zip code piece affecting the the uh, the restaurant those things you could start seeing as interconnected in your entire business model that might be based on channels or communications or customer experience and stuff like that. So the, this kind of leads us into um, some key some key outputs. So now, if we have an insight, with that that might lead us to help us have a problem statement. But a problem statement is not equal to a business hy problem hypothesis. Now, a problem statement is really a statement for a business, and a hypothesis statement is something that we as designers want to take on as a challenge, right? Based on what we know. We want to it, explore further. And one is written as a statement, right? Like, and the other is sometimes written as a question mark. Um, and hypothesis statements work a little bit more like this. It's, it looks very similar. It's still a writing exercise, but it's switched around a little bit differently. And when we say we, it means like us designers, not the business as a whole. It's like we as people who think about your user and the whole system together. So rather than just talk, talking about the business side, we're now combining that user side piece into this to kind of generate this. And this is something that you know is very similar. Our product, our product or service provides users with goals. We have observed that our product or service isn't meeting these goals. You can see this is written very similar. But think about it being written from like how you as a designer could do that. We think by improving whatever that service is and testing it through a, a, a few ways, right? By testing it with 12 users or by putting it out in the world and doing that. Now, like this needs to take on more of a user-centered component of testing rather than a like KPI, like very driven by business output. We will be able to gain something from our end users. 
So now this is where it's starting to be a conversation. What are you trying to accomplish with your, with, with your users? Are you trying to make them happier? Are you trying to make them more interested? Are you trying to engage them intellectually so that they will give their last dying will to the museum? Who knows, right? And that could then result in measurable improvements for the, the theater or whatever this is. It's going to feel kind of similar to the problem statement, but it's just written in a way that is, allows it to be design-centric. It's about you as a designer filling that space rather than the business doing this. So it, in the cases of this, uh, I like to use the problem statement with my client, and then I translate their problem statement into a hypothesis statement for us as designers to use. So it's not, I'm not using exactly the same language. Does that make sense? So choose either a really great problem statement or a really great hypothesis statement. Bring either of those in for next week, but you have to have one good one. But I would like you to write both of these. Because that will then lead us to, to next week. And next week we're going to do ideation. We're gonna, I want you to come with your, as I was saying before, your sticky notes, markers. Uh, if you have, like, everyone should have an insight. Everyone should have a problem statement or a, a good hypothesis statement. Like, c either print it out or ready for you. Because we have, uh, we're going to be joining up in, like, little groups to do some ideation. Um, and this is about generation. So, like, if you're already thinking of ideas and doing that, just start writing them down a little bit. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, but I want all those things to be clear. And please post me your like iterated insight and your problem statement before next week so I can kind of see that um, before we start. So I can kind of help or you know iterate those things as we move. Is that clear? And that's that. That's it for the for the lecture. Unless anybody wants to uh, work on this while we're here. Or we can close it out. Unless you want to stay longer on online, but I did take a red eye last night. Everybody good? Yes, thank you for the lecture. Yeah, yeah. yeah okay. Yes, oh, all good. Okay, great. Thank I'll you see, so very much. Yeah, I'll see everyone next week. Please come. Oh, and by the way, it was not my dog. <laughs> no, oh. just kidding. Okay, I don't know. Some, <laughs> something was making noise. I don't remember. But, it doesn't matter. but thanks, yeah. uh, thanks everyone for joining. Um, I know this was kind of a little unconventional, but when you yeah. join the working world, this is like standard operating procedure, unfortunately. So now you're getting practice in um, joining conference calls and, and, and being good. Oh, you want me to Will define you? what is a good insight? Oh, man. Uh, that Will you hard. post this lecture online in the modules? Will I what? Will you post the slides online in the modules? Because I don't see... Yes, they, were just, they just weren't uploading. I'll do that right now. Okay. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. Good night. Uh-huh.
Yeah. 